So John invited me to talk about what was alive for me right now. So I picked four topics, hoping they might offer you something in your own work. Um, and so I'm gonna speak briefly about each of them uh, for five minutes or so. And then please ask questions about anything I've said or take it in a new direction, but I thought it would be fun to have a conversation. So this is not a lecture. Um, I'd like to begin with a poem um, by Kanai Taman. Kanai is the national poet of Tonga, the South Pacific Island nation of Tonga. And I've just come back from a three months journey in the South Pacific Islands, and I do a lot of work in that part of the world. And I just wanted to invoke sort of the idea of circular time and looking at things differently because, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and just to invoke the idea of looking at things a little bit differently. Because being an Antioch radical, that's what I do <laughs> or try to do. Um, it's called Why Do You Say by Kone Taman. Why do you say that all good things must come to an end? It cannot be. The wind whirls, making the palm trees sway, sometimes gracefully sometimes painfully. The earth travels around the sun, making it rise and fall and rise again. The moon is the same, moving around the earth, never stopping. The seasons form a circle around us, and we always come back to where we were. Good things do not come to an end. They only wait for our return. Um, so I think I mentioned the structure enough, but um, please feel free to hold your questions or other questions that arise for you uh, as I talk. A frame for everything I'm going to say is education. I'm an environmental educator, uh, been a teacher for a long time. I started with elementary school teaching. I was even an elementary school principal um, at one time, which set my whole course. It's really the same as higher ed <laughs> in a lot of ways, working with young children. Um, so a lot of what I'll say will be um, education oriented. And what I'm going to do is say a little bit, and then I thought I'd uh, read a little bit from each, for, from some recent work on these, on these topics. So learning and education is sort of the unifying principle. Um, so first, climate anxiety. About a generation ago, guided by the Earth Charter, and I understand that some of you are familiar with the Earth Charter or even using it in your work, um, I decided it was time in my career to um, work with the next, with the coming generations. Now, we always do this as teachers, but I really wanted to do it in a much more conscious way. The heart of the Earth Charter, in my opinion, is the concept of intergenerational equity. And that is to be guided by the needs of future generations as well as our own. And that's also the heart of sustainability when you think about it. That our, I mean, even the classic definition by Gro Harlem Brundtland that um, development that's sustainable is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So this is um, both a practical idea in terms of sustainability or sustainable development, as problematic as that term is, or just an idea of uh, a moral principle that ought to guide our lives, that we um, have indeed an ethical responsibility to those who follow us. So I started to really work with that. The, the Earth I became um, uh, deeply enamored of the Earth Charter. How many of you are familiar with the Earth Charter? Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, it, it's a statement of ethical principles for, um, for a sustainable future. And it's a, it's a wonderful long story of how it was written. It involved all the major faith traditions, although the, uh, including indigenous, although the word God is not mentioned in the Earth Charter. And it involved um, representatives of indigenous cultures, faith groups, labor unions, uh, governments from all, all around the world. And it took um, 13 years to write. Uh, and every word was uh, precious. Um, so anyway, it's a great, it's a great help 
Um, and the biggest challenge that I've faced is nothing like the challenge. It's the challenge that young people face. I realized very early on, even back when I was teaching elementary school, that um, children were carrying a great deal of grief and even despair and worry um, about the future. At, when I was doing workshops with, with children and their parents, the worry was more about nuclear weapons. That was sort of the Gorbachev, Reagan era. But um, now, of course, we have, call it eco-anxiety, call it cli climate anxiety is, is, I think, the best term in some ways because it's really a concern about the compromise of their future from climate change. So this is just a little bit from a talk that I gave last year at the Pontifical University in Rome um, on, um, it was called uh, Intergenerational Solidarity, Education in a Time of Climate and Theological Emergency. And I think young people feel that this is an emergency, both in terms of theology and in terms of um, science and, uh, and certainly in terms of the relevance of their education. Part of the challenge we face in education is distress about the climate emergency felt by young people. And there's an amazing um, study, uh, a recent study in 2021 by Carolyn Hook, uh, Hickman and others is entitled Young People's Voices on Climate Anxiety, Government Betrayal and Moral Injury, a Global Phenomenon. And this shows how deep the crisis of climate concern among youth is. The authors conclude, and I won't quote for too long here, but they conclude that distress about climate change is associated with young people perceiving that they have no future, that humanity is doomed, that governments are failing to respond adequately. And the response is with feelings of betrayal and abandonment by governments and adults. Um, so this is a very, very deep crisis. And they conclude that failures of government to prevent harm from climate change could be argued to be a failure of ethical responsibility uh, leading to uh, moral injury. So uh, what I want to say about that is that I think education based on an ethic of intergenerational equity can really help us with that and that the response to this crisis that young people feel is intergenerational learning and uh, working together, even intergenerational collaboration, solidarity, call it what you want, but uh, we must stand in solidarity across generations. By the way, that study um, was of 10,000 youth in 10 different countries, seven in the Northern Hemisphere, three in the Southern Hemisphere, so a very comprehensive study. This is a global phenomenon not just the Western world, not just the Northern Hemisphere. So we, I put that on the table as, as a concern that I'm actively working with and um, for what it, it, it might be for you. Um, the second subject I wanted to bring to us today is indigeneity. And um, I'm fortunate to work with indigenous um, knowledge in Australia primarily, but also in other places. Um, um, so in celebration of the end of this dreadful doctrine of discovery, I wanted to tell a story and draw out maybe some, some meaning for us. Um, many, many years ago, a colleague of mine in Australia, uh, Jim Bowler, who's now in his 90s, um, he's a climate scientist and he was out walking in what's called the Willandra Lakes region. They're no longer lakes, they were lakes tens of thousands of years ago. And he came upon the cremated remains of a female who is now called Mungo Lady. She, it's the oldest known remains of a cremation uh, on earth. And a few years later, he was out walking and he saw a cranium in the sand and discovered the oldest known burial. And that we call, we call him Mungo Man. The Aboriginal people say that Mungo Lady and Mungo Man discovered Jim. And um, I, the reason that they discovered Jim 
um, is in the story, I suppose. He was a professor at the National University, ANU of Australia, and they took the bones and they took the cremate, they took things off to the university without permission, mm -hmm. without asking the people, as one did in those days, perhaps. But certainly, um, and Jim uh, spent the rest of, of, of his, he spent 43 years uh, trying to change that mistake and to have those uh, those remains returned. And indeed, um, it came to pass that finally the governments and the university returned, and also with the remains of 153 other human remains of people who had been taken away. And I had the extraordinary opportunity to be part of the return of those remains from the university. The Aboriginal people divide the country, in the, the continent, into 200 countries. And so every time we passed a border from one indigenous country to another country, there was ceremony and celebration, and it was extraordinary. And I wrote a little bit about it, and I wanted to say, this is from a paper that I co-wrote with Mindahi Bastida, who's an elder from what is now Mexico. It's urgent to restrict anthropocentric thought and return to the original principles. These instruct us as to how to live in peace with Mother Earth and her sacred elements and with nature. We need an integrated world based on dialogue, reciprocity, and complementarity that will carry through future generations. We must strengthen the work of those who, in continuity with their originating principles, sustain the ancient wisdom and spiritual traditional practices that preserve the sacred balance of Earth. The return to country of Mungo Man was a profound example of this, setting in motion forces of dignity, harmony, peace, unity. The repatriation of Mungo Man and companion Aboriginal remains was momentous. It represented a powerful reconciliation seldom found between the dominant and Aboriginal cultures. It was a deeply emotional journey home for those peoples from whom the physical remains of an important ancestor were taken away carelessly and unceremoniously. The ancestors were, turned with the, were returned with the utmost care and high ceremony. Um, we felt that there was at work something much more important. Mindahi and I were guests of this, on this. We felt um, that there was something much more important at work as well. There was, through Aboriginal awareness, a wider consciousness of all the elements, the rocks, the animals, and the plants that were speaking to witness this university of life. Participants felt that putting things right with the land and the people was healing and full of meaning and significance. And we were moving in the realm of spirit with great force. And I use this as an example that I was personally privileged to experience of how powerful reconciliation and healing with this broken um, relationship can be. It was perhaps the most important experience of my life in, in, in it really in my body and in the land and in everything that was around me to feel that level of reconciliation and healing. I think what it did for me was it helped me see that it's possible and and to, to know how much work we have to do. We're very far from that. But there are so many new um, inchoate emergent initiatives to do this. And in some places it's quite advanced. And so I just put that on the table as, again, um, looking at that as an educator, indigenous knowledge is so important to where we are now and where we have to go and how quickly we have to go there. And so that's just an, an acknowledgement of indigeneity and harmony in um, education, okay? So that's the second piece. And the third piece is um, wonder. Um, I brought wonder to the circle because it's illuminated my entire life <laughs> as a child, as a student, as a, um, a, an Antioch undergrad when I read Rachel Carson's The Sense of Wonder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, how many of you have read that book? 
Oh, it changed my life. Read it. It's, it's a wonderful book. She never had the chance to finish it. It was a little article she wrote for Women's Home Companion magazine. She put it aside to write The Silent Spring because she thought that was her moral duty and obligation. But her heart was in this sense of wonder. And, um, you know, she was a remarkable person. And Silent Spring is probably the most important book of the 20th century. I'd make a case for that. Um, but this little book um, has taught me and generations of others that um, a sense of wonder um, lasts a lifetime. She asks, um, this is from a little piece I wrote on, on uh, significant life experiences. Significant life experiences are the experiences or the part of it that I'm interested in are, are, are the significant life experiences that lead to environmental sensibility, sensitivity, sensibility. And many people um, describe their that. You know, Thomas Berry talks about his experience as a child in the field with the lilies. And many, in fact, one of the things we do in this field is study autobiographies to see who talks about those moments of epiphany when they connect very deeply. But Rachel Carson asks in The Sense of Wonder, is the exploration of the natural world just a pleasant way to pass the golden hours of childhood? Or is there something deeper? And she answers, I'm sure there is something much deeper, something lasting and significant. And then Louise Chawa, one of the lead researchers in our field, um, says, we do not need to consciously preserve these memories. We know that we can never lose them. They emit energy across all the years of our life. And um, sometimes these experiences are in nature, most often the research shows, but sometimes it's a book. Sometimes it's a moment, a teach, a teaching moment. And I'm sure you all have some, and I hope you're feeling them right now. But there, we have these, 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 these moments of wonder. Um, Maxine Green, my favorite educational philosopher, uh, um, writes, landscapes are the lived places, the perceived places that represent our crown, our origin. They evoke the sensed, the invited and felt realities that enveloped all of us when we were very young before we circumscribed things with our minds. And these, the research shows that most often these experiences do occur in childhood, but not always. And it's never too late to be a, uh, it's never too late to have a childhood experience, right? <laughs> but um, it, it, I bring wonder because I've been thinking a lot about it and so have many other people. Wonder is a whole new re-research topic in psychology now. There's so much in wonder if you look in, in the psychological literature. And I think we realize that it's an, it can be an antidote to grief and uh, to um, sadness and, and um, provide us with some sort of radiant vision that we can connect with from our own lived experiences. Um, and that leads us directly to radical hope. Am I doing all right on time? You're fine. Good. Um, so radical hope. What's radical hope? I don't know if any of you have read. It's not my term, but I love it. I adopted it um, because I've been in, long, long interested in hope um, as a, again, as an antidote to um, despair and radical hope. It just sounds so great, doesn't it? Um, and hope i remember i always would have my students after i taught school i became a professor of educational studies and i um i would teach people who wanted to be educators and teach philosophy of education and methodologies and so on and we always would talk about hope and i remember um one of my students at college of the atlantic i had the, the um, good fortune to have a grand piano in my classroom and when we were sharing, he, he went to the piano and he played a piece that he called, Where Does the Light Come From? And I think uh, radical hope is a kind of light that we need in our lives right now. Um, I, I uh, 
Well, oh, I wanted to acknowledge that the term radical hope, though, comes from Jonathan, a book by Jonathan Lear. And it's, has anyone read that? Radical hope? It's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a story of the Crow Nation and how their culture was destroyed by us and, um, how uh, the question that's raised in the book is how, how does how do you recover from your culture being destroyed how 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 do you face the possibility that your culture culture has collapsed that's what the book radical hope is about and so i i bring that in because for a couple of reasons um one is that i'm facing this myself in a small way. I live on Sanibel Island, which was destroyed by the Hurricane Ian about six months ago. And so I've been uh, thinking a lot about radical hope because our, I, I lost my house and all that, but that's, um, and that's not nothing, but it, um, we lost the whole community. We lost the whole community and it's a very beautiful place. We protected, we worked hard for, decades to protect Sanibel. How many, have you ever been there or know, know of it? Okay, beautiful place, huh? Um, one of the best shelling island, places for shells in the world. Um, uh, over two thirds of the island was protected largely through citizen action, although we have the National Wildlife Refuge there and so on. Very strict building. The city exists for the purpose of protecting the animals. The vision, the founding vision of the city is to protect the wildlife. The only community in the United States that has a population limit, a human population limit, and it all has been completely destroyed. There's not a, a building on Sanibel that's not damaged. And all the beautiful old wooden buildings that we saved, they're gone. Gone. I mean, gone. It was the most extraordinary thing to start seeing these NASA photos. and. You, this little set of cabins or whatever, it's gone. You, you think, um, this isn't supposed to happen to white privileged people. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, it does remind us that we're experiencing, and all indigenous people have been reminding and war telling us warning, foreshadowing for us for a long time, that what has befallen indigenous people throughout the world and so many others now as a result of climate change is going to befall all of us. And so radical hope for me is a, it's not a given, let's put it that way. Radical hope is something that we need to construct. Whatever that means, philosophically and spiritually in one's own life that we need and we will need ever more radical hope as we go forward. And so I talk to my students about being in touch with the sources of your strength. Um, coming to know how you will face this storm. So the good news is that I think um, young people are very responsive to this and very able and willing and wanting to have some sort of a balance to their anxiety. And uh, so I bring you uh, radical hope. So thank you for your interest in my work. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for all the good work that you're doing. And um, my hope is, or my, my hope, we play the, have a play on words there. My hope is that, uh, um, by introducing a concern for climate anxiety and by reminding us of the wisdom of the indigenous people and by um, valorizing hope and invoking a sense of wonder that um, I've brought some offering for you in your work. Thank you. Thank you.